Well, I'm going to speak to you a message today called Simplify Your Life. It's worth showing up just for that title. Simplify Your Life. This has not come to me cheap. It did not come to me easy. So don't be fooled by the casual delivery to think this is not a massive thing that's been said in this next 30 minutes. This message comes to you really courtesy of Gertrude Peacock. There she is. Isn't she beautiful? She's the oldest person I know that we know. She's 106. She's still alive. She was about 103 there when she was much younger. <laughs> we have known Gertrude since she was in her mid-70s. How weird is that to say about anyone? And we've known her for 30 years plus since her mid-70s. She used to babysit all of our kids. And, and, and the fact that she survived that, I'm surprised she's lived this long. <laughs> We'd say to our kids, how did it go? We said to Gertrude, how did it go when we came over and, you know, came back and she went home? Oh, it was great. The kids were no trouble. We knowing the kids were probably were trouble. So the next morning we said to the kids, how did it go? Were you gentle? Were you kind? Were you obedient for Gertrude? She's old. And they said, oh, it was awesome. We had her wrestling with us on the floor. We, we got her to take her teeth out for us. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. And Gertrude never told us all the abuse that our kids put into her life. She was amazing and beautiful. And of all the people we continued to visit when we stopped pastoring, she was the one that we kept visiting and dropping into her world. And I figured it, that she's the oldest person I knew. So when she was nudging 90, I said to her, Gertrude, is there anything you could tell me to help me age well, you know, you might as well ask, can't you, haven't you? You might as well, somebody that's 100 plus going to be living forever. I said, what, what do you think? Could you tell me anything? She said, Paul, sit down. Let me tell you something. I said, Ooh, this is great. She said, at the start of every decade, I sat down with a pen and paper and I wrote down a number of things that I should not do anymore and a number of things I should do more of. And she said, I believe that in that list was the key to my surviving and living and doing well for another decade. She said, you should do that. You should sit down at the start of every new decade and make a list of things that are things you need to do more of or do less of. And she said, I think if you just did that, that you would age well and live a long time. And I said, wow, well, what kind of things do you mean? She said, well, I just turned 90 and I decided that I should not be as independent as I have been in my living because she fell and broke her wrist on the ice going to get a cab to church because she wouldn't let anyone give her a lift because she was so not wanted to put anybody out. She's that kind of lady. So she broke her wrist and decided, okay, I cannot risk this in my old age walking on the ice. I am going to get some help. I'm going to go into assisted living. And at the age of 91, she also decided on her list eventually to give in to all the nagging of the family that she would have a pacemaker fitted in her heart. These were things that she felt would give her more longevity than, than 90. And when she was 99, 100-ish years old, she had to go into hospital for surgery. Guess for what? To change the pacemaker batteries. <laughs> yes. What a thing to have on your social media and your CV. I outlived those Duracell pacemaker batteries. <laughs> the surgeon said, we have never done surgery on anybody as old as you to change pacemaker batteries. She's 106. She's so tired. She's so fed up. She so wants to go to heaven. Those flipping batteries are keeping her alive. <laughs> And I want to speak to you about seven things that I wrote down when I began my 50s, you know, a few years ago. I'm still in them, just. That were seven things that I thought would help me to simplify my life and may help you simplify yours too. You need to make up your own list. Some of these will apply to you. Some of them won't. But these are my seven. Because we need to know all of us, complexity is not neutral. Complexity is costly. You know, in the corporate world, complexity costs the corporate world. Billions of pounds every year are wasted because of unnecessary things that 
leaders and bosses and companies allowed to get involved in their business and everything that's unnecessary and non-essential requires funding and resourcing and management and meetings and all those multiple layers on something that was not required in the first place create complexity that has massive financial implications. Complexity is like fat and stress. There's good versions and bad versions of both. This church has developed beyond where you began and your life now as a church is spread out, multifaceted, multi-venue, multi-campus, multi-locations here around Europe and the world. That brings with it its own kind of complexity. We don't mind that. We welcome complexity in our lives that is serving our mission, our, our purpose, our vision. We don't mind that. But there's another kind of complexity that hides in the shadows of the good complexity. It's right next to it. It's so similar to it that we don't sometimes recognize the bad version from the good version. This unnecessary, unhelpful complexity that does not help your life to stay simple is what I'm after exposing and helping you figure out in your life today in this session with you. And I'm gonna give you seven things. There's more, but here's my current top seven that have served me well for the last few years of my life. You all ready? Yeah. All right, number one, here goes. Number one key to simplify your life, reduce drama. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Should we just stay here for 30 minutes? Should we just stay here? Now, in this next few minutes as I speak about drama, everybody look straight at me. I'm on my phone already. Where are you? Are you in the room? I hope you're listening because you need to hear this. Oh my gosh, drama. Thank God someone said it. Now, I would have said remove drama, but it's hard to remove it if you're married to it. Or... Or, or if it's your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or if it's your parents, or your kids, or your best friends, or your boss, removing it becomes more difficult when you're attached to it. So I decided to downgrade my language to be more realistic and talk about reducing drama. If you can remove it, good. But if you can reduce it, then at least do that. If you will commit this year to go on a drama reduction campaign. <laughs> you will simplify your life and you will survive, not just survive, you will flourish this year in a drama-free year. We would like to say to all of you who are the drama queens of our life, <laughs> please take this year off. <laughs> we would like you to take a vacation from bringing so much stress and drama to our lives because drama is not neutral. Drama is very, very costly. And what we want to say to you who we love in our lives, um, because we can't remove you, so we gotta love you. We, we love you and want to say to you that your gift to us, your greatest gift to us is that you would this year become a low maintenance person. Oh, yes. We would like you to be emotionally inexpensive. Yes. Of all your New Year's resolutions, forget it. Get rid of them all. Because the one that matters the most to us is that your resolution this year is, I am going to have a drama-free year. Ta-da! We would love you to practice that this year because drama is costing you. Drama is not neutral. It is expensive. And drama, here's the thing about drama. This is how easy it is to have one. It needs three ingredients. It needs a victim, moi, a villain, you, and a conspiracy theory. Oh, do you know what? You see the way she looked at me? I'm telling you now, she looks at me like that all the time. That woman has got it in for me. You know what? You know why I think she looks at me like that? Because she was talking to so-and-so over there last week. You know what they were doing? Talking about me. You know, you, know, you know why they didn't, you know, they invited you. They never invite me. You know why they don't invite me? Because they hate my guts. They're against me. Do you know why? Because I'm a threat to them because I'm so brilliant. 
and I put them in the shade when I'm there and they're threatened by my company in social circles because I'm so quick-witted and smart and cool and fantastic. <laughs> Conspiracy theories. I've got to tell you, Hollywood are making blockbusters on those three things. And some of you are involved in your own blockbuster. <laughs> because drama is all to do with, listen to this carefully, drama is all to do with the story in your head. You all have a story in your head and various people have various parts in that story and various lines are allotted to them and they always say these lines because they're the villain, they're the bad person, so that's their lines. And you have your drama and your actors and your script and in every single scene, you are the victim. They are the villain and it's the same conspiracy theory and here we go for another year. We would like you this year to go on a drama reduction exercise because we think if you will do that, this will assist you in aging well and simplifying your life. And so, we would like you to stop being the ranter of the group, the exaggerator, the one that overreacts to something that when you analyze the facts, everybody say facts. What happened to them? Can you just calm down and can you tell me the facts? What do you mean the facts? What's the facts got to do with it? Everything. And if you could reduce the story in your head to the facts, then you might realize, you know what? Mm, that wasn't worth the drama, was it? Exactly. <laughs> now, I do not stand here myself immune from drama. I am known to have my own drama queen moments, especially if you're in the room with me when I'm trying to cancel something online. You think you're a drama-free person? I dare you, ring Sky TV. Uh, they'll get your blood pressure up in a heartbeat. Drama TV, dr drama, dr dr I, I rang Sky and I said, I want to cancel five quid of my subscription. I don't want that channel anymore. I'm not kidding you. It took me 20 minutes to get to a real person. And then 10 minutes to explain to them what I wanted after they tried to keep selling me stuff, which I didn't call for. You know, stuff online is rigged against you, don't you? It's rigged to lean on and benefit from our laziness. Because they know ringing is such a drama and we have too much drama in our world that we don't bother ringing. And if millions of us don't bother ringing and it's all three quid ahead, whose pocket's that going to? See? So there's a lot of money in complexity. There is a lot of money in you staying with your complexity. There is a lot of money that benefits others if you don't commit to simplifying your life. And I want to ask you this year to think about giving us the big gift of reducing drama in your world. There I said it at the London Palladium on a stage that's filled with drama normally. <laughs> I know. What a place to say reduce the drama. Number two, learn to say no. N n n n n n n I know I don't need these pair of shoes, but they're so beautiful. Oh, they suit you. They suit you. You look amazing, stunning. Oh, if I were you, hang on a minute. Let me get you something else that goes with it. Hello. No, no. Can I sell? Can I? Can I? Can I pack these up? Can I? Can I? Can I get them ready for you? No. 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 You've got to practice in the mirror saying, no, 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 I don't want them. No, I don't need them. No, no. It's such a short word, but it sticks in some of your throats so badly. If you will learn to say no, you will simplify your life. Because I tell you something, every time you say yes, but you meant no, it complicates your life. Every false yes is not neutral. Because every time you're doing something, involved in something, go somewhere, inconvenience yourself for something you should have said no to, it builds up inside you a resentment. And now you feel used, now you feel taken advantage of, but the truth is that you keep saying yes. And some of you especially are prone to this because you are a people-pleasing person. 
you're lovely, but you need to get stronger this year because by personality, you, you just want to be liked and included and thought well of. So no gets really difficult for you. You know, no is the first word we learn as kids. But sociologists tell us, and I think it's true from my own experience in life, that the older we get, the harder no is to say. Because the older you get, the more, the more there are... The more friendship, relational, societal barriers we hit, we feel we hit when we say no. Because no, when you're older, sounds like you're not helpful, you're uncooperative, you're rude, you're unloving, you will not be understanding, you're not compassionate. So saying no as you get older to people that really genuinely you'd like to help sometimes gets more difficult. So we say yes and we say yes and we say yes. All those yeses pile up and complicate your life. So I decided in my early 50s, I am going to learn to get much better at saying no. I'm going to get good at saying no to people in the church who believe they're called in life to waste my time. <laughs> Overfed, under-exercised Christians who want to keep coming to me, telling me their problems, and take my counsel who have no intention of changing. Go figure. Some people that have so many problems with the devil, the devil this, this is the conspiracy theory, the drama, the devil this, the devil that, here a devil, there a devil, everywhere a devil, devil. <laughs> the best thing we can say to some Christians is, come out of that demon and leave it alone. You should be on a percentage because you represent the devil so well. You're, his, you're the best agent he's got in the world. You've got to learn to say no. You've got to learn to say no well. Some of you don't like saying no because you don't know how to say it well. I read a great book, recommend it to you. It's called The Power of a Positive No. The title got my interest. And the book will help you to learn how to say no well. Because some of you, it's not, it's not that you don't, no, you should say no. You just don't know how to say no really well. This book was helpful because saying no really well sounds like, hey, you know what? I'd love to help. But I've got to tell you, this is not a good time for me. I'm really in a busy season of my life. And maybe two or three weeks time, call me again. Um, but I'm really busy right now and I'm sorry uh, that I can't help. But you know, so-and-so person that I met the other day, I know they're free at the moment, but you haven't used the no words yet. But we get the idea, you're saying no, but didn't use the no word. That is a skill that many of you can develop in life to become brilliant at saying no without saying no. Add that skill. Learning to say no is a skill. And saying it well is a skill worth investing in as you age or you young people in here. I wish someone had told me this when I was your age. <laughs> I wish somebody told me a lot of things when I was your age. I had three kids by the time I was 20. I know. You're like, what? My wife and I had three kids by the time I was 20. She was 21 because we got married at 16 and 17. I know. <laughs> Our oldest daughter, Charlotte, who some of you know, was five months old when we got married. Then we had twins. Shocked face emoji. <laughs> what? Twins, I know. I didn't sleep for three years. <laughs> we got our twins home at different times. And we got the first twin home. And she went to Glenda's side of the bed. And she just slept awesome. Little Ruth. She was just such a placid, calm, sleep-through baby. A couple of weeks later, when she put enough weight on, we got Bethan home. Bethan came to my side of the bed. She didn't sleep at all. I was working in a carpet warehouse in a laboring job, started early in the morning, worked all day, came back late at night. These were the days before disposable nappies, okay? Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you are thinking, are you telling me somebody wasn't in jail? I'm talking terry toweling nappies. Huh? Come on. And the stuff we, the solution we soaked them in is the kind of thing you'd see on Breaking Bad. Now somebody will be in jail for selling it. 
but it was in our house. The whole house was toxic as we sterilized and baptized and immersed and cleaned and all this stuff. And so I got so desperate one night because I wasn't sleeping. When she wasn't looking, I swapped the babies. I put the sleeper at my side and put the crier at her side. And when she was up all night, she said to me, I don't know what's wrong with Ruth, she's just not sleeping. I said, you know what, that's really strange, but mine's sleeping great at the moment. And then one night, she got suspicious and thought, there's something not right here. You could only tell them apart then by pulling up their little baby grow. And one of them had a little birthmark here. Ruth had a little birthmark here, the sleeper. And she pulled up their baby grow in the night and saw that Ruth was at my side. I was in the doghouse for a few nights from then on. <laughs> but you got to do what you got to do, eh, fellas? Where's the men in here? Bit of support from the men. I know you were all kids and not parents yet. Don't know what I'm talking about. But hey, if you ever have twins, there's a heads up for you right there. <laughs> Number three, be yourself. Ooh, we should have had a drum roll or something then. We should have had angels river dancing on the stage then. <laughs> for what it's cost me to tell you that. Be yourself. It is exhausting not being who God intended you to be. You know, you know, don't you? Every single one of you were born a complete original and a complete genius. You know, that's the good news. The bad news is the day you were born is the last day of freedom you'll ever have. It's the last day God had you to himself. After that, he entrusts you. He releases you to family or to guardians. He releases you to experiences and voices and influences in your life and to contexts and environments and cultures, all of which start to get busy, turning you into their idea of who they think you should be. You get to your 30s or 40s and have a job you hate, live somewhere you wish you didn't live, and have built a life around an identity that was never yours in the first place. And the longer we leave this, the harder it gets to go back and fix it. That's why I'm saying this now, especially in this service and the prior one, where more of the youth of the church, I am told, are here. And I want to say to you, young people, whatever you do, as soon as possible in your life, try and make this commitment, this decision, however it occurs to you, to be you. I pray for every parent that you have and every guardian, everyone that's entrusted to lead us, that they will give you room to be who God made you to be. I've got, we've got eight grandchildren. The whole grandchild thing is out of control, by the way. I've told my kids, enough, no more. Because they all live five minutes from us and we are sitting ducks. <laughs> this big old farmhouse with its sitting ducks for random grandchild invasions. They age from 13 down to nearly two. There's two in the middle, brother and sister, Jonah and Sienna. He's seven, she's five. Already these two kids are showing the potential right now that when they're older, they will be outstanding criminals. Is <laughs> the best thing I could think they should do with their lives right now. Because they lie and they deceive and they manipulate and they, 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 they plan and plot together. They're geniuses. And he, he is a little bit, you know, ADD, whatever you call it, but he's got a forensic memory. He, he's genius on Minecraft. He remembers numbers. He's got, a, he's got a photographic memory for numbers. I said to his parents, listen, whatever happens, you owe me this, at least this. When he's 20, I'm taking him to Las Vegas. Huh? Just a weekend in Vegas, my little rain man, I call him. You owe me at least that for all the free dinners I've given him and the babysitting nights we've done. His sister, called Sienna, she has a different problem. It's called being a diva. For the moment she wakes up, she is Elsa. I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm not talking just the dress. I mean crown, I mean wand, shoes, the whole deal. She's Elsa. It's that 
or naked. <laughs> That's it. You're a good look parent in those two criminals. When I think of Sienna, the word that comes to my mind is unreasonable. Taking her for a walk is a nightmare. She won't hold your hand. She won't cooperate. She walks where she shouldn't. She sits where she shouldn't. She sits down in the middle of the pavement because she has a stone in her shoe. <laughs> Not where people are whizzing by on bicycles and all kinds of stuff. It's crazy. And I look at these kids and I say to my kids, you know, my, your gift to them is to somehow see what part of that is original and unique and part of their God-given flair and brilliance and try to protect that because you know what? The education system in this country is killing our kids. It is. I hate it. Even school teachers, now it's an all-time low in morale amongst our school teachers who went into teaching because they loved the kids but now themselves are enslaved to a system that's obsessed with tests and grades that tell you nothing about that kid. It worries me for my grandkids. Worries me for their, their battling that system because it's a systemic narrow-mindedness about one particular form of intelligence called academics. And the question is not how intelligent are you? The question is, how are you intelligent? Because there are so many ways that you in here are intelligent that aren't even on the school radar. But they'll make you, they'll make you feel bad. And they'll call you remedial for not being good at maths or science or history. But at the same time, they don't hand you something else back to say, but you are a genius with animals or you have massive emotional intelligence, or you are a brilliant instinctive leader, or you are great with picking up languages, they will fine you. They will slap a fine on you for taking your kids to see a whale in Alaska. Because they want you to look at one in a book at school. They will fine you for going to another country, being surrounded by Spanish-speaking people because you miss Spanish in school or it was taught badly by someone that didn't enjoy the subject themselves. Because they're driven by trying to get a test passed for you rather than enjoying teaching that language to you. I've got to move on. Don't get me started on education. You didn't. I started myself. <laughs> it was a little rant. It was a little drama moment then. I'm back in the room. Be yourself. Be yourself. It was only a few years ago that I decided to have the courage to say, I am an introvert. I love people, but I have my limits. I don't recharge in groups. I don't recharge at social events. You know what? I have been dragged to parties all my life. I said to my wife, listen, I'm going to go to the party, but here's the deal. If I go to the party, I'm going to spend all night in the, in the corner with Neil, who doesn't want to be there either. Because he's also an introvert, was also dragged there, so we text each other. You're going tonight? Yeah, you're going, yeah. Let's just stay in the corner and talk to each other all night about motorcycles and stuff. Because we're both into motorcycles. And then just hope no one tries to talk to us with small talk. <laughs> Introverts hate small talk. And I realized that because I've grown up in a charismatic Pentecostal church, all the extroverts in the church have been trying to fix me all their lives. <laughs> we need to help him. Bless him. Bless him. We need to get him out more. Get him more social. Bless him. We need to help him. He's so withdrawn. No, no, no. Freaking leave me alone. <laughs> He's in a world of his own. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we put all the clappy, shouty people on stage. Yeah. And all the introverts are like, oh, God, I could never do that. Is that what leadership looks like? Oh, count me out. Ooh. <laughs> Jesus was a massive introvert. Ooh. Bible says he often withdrew to solitary places. Party animals don't do that. <laughs> they avoid them. Party animals can't stand being on their own. They don't like their own company. That's why they're on the phone texting all the time because they're on their own on the bus for three minutes. <laughs> uh. Number four, get organized. Ooh, this is a biggie. 
Get organized. If you want to simplify your life, you have to get organized. You know, you young people in here, you've got a big dream and vision for your life and you've got this great idea and the destiny. Great. Listen to me. It's hard to change the world when you can't find your keys. Ah, uh, it's hard to take London for Jesus when your phone's not charged. Because you keep forgetting to plug it in and you're on your third phone this year and it's only February. Because you keep losing them and dropping them down toilet and stuff. And the screen's cracked again because you sat on it because your jeans are too tight. Because you're committed to skinny jeans, you're a slave to fashion. So, so you ram that phone between your backside and your back pocket. It even changes the way you walk because it's so tight. And then you sat down and crack. Third one this year. Hey, get an elasticated waist and just get over it and just get some room in your jeans because... You know, being disorganized is not neutral. I hope you know being disorganized complicates your life. Been late all the time. Hello. You know, when you're disorganized, you spend all your life saying sorry. Sorry, sorry. I'm a bit late. Sorry. Running a bit late. Sorry. Be there soon. Sorry. You start without me. I'll be there soon. Sorry. Yeah, here's my order. Order my food for me. I'm running a bit late. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. Hey, everybody, I'm here. Sorry, I'm late. Sorry, sorry. Shut up. <laughs> and, and please, just this year, maybe for us, who you keep telling us you love so much, maybe show up on time. Even better, this is pushing it, I know. Early. <laughs> early. If you showed up somewhere this week early, I promise you, Everyone that knows you never show up on time, always late. If you show up early, I promise you, they'll be so surprised, they'll need medication <laughs> to deal with you being early. And whatever you did, whatever you did to be early, repeat. 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 Well, they only set off 10 minutes earlier. Aha! This is the key to becoming more organized and bis being disorganized costs you money. It costs you friendship because we get fed up of it. Because you keep being late and we're attached to you because we're the ones picking you up so we're late as well. So everyone in the car is late because you were late as we all waited outside for you to do something you could have done 30 minutes earlier. If you want to simplify your life, if you want to go to the next level in your life, it depends often on things people don't tell us like just get organized. Organization is not about tidiness. It is about committing to live well. It is about committing to add that value to your life that just lets you decomplicate your life. Number five, margin. Put some margin in your life. Ooh, I wish someone had told me this when I was younger. If this hand represents your sweet spot of where you function really well, this is where you consistently function well, your sweet spot in life. And this hand represents the limits of you as a person, where you start breaking down and you start losing it and getting short and getting stressed and not sleeping well. This hand represents the limits. The closer this hand, the closer this sweet spot starts to move too far towards the max and the limits. The narrower the gap gets between these two places, that's margin. That space is margin. And the more you start to live frantic, burn the candle at both ends, don't rest, don't relax, don't turn off, don't... And by the way, you know, you know this, don't you? There's now proper rehab programs for people that are addicted to their phones. Ooh. So the more you are in touch, we, we thank God for progress and the beauty of progress is the blessing and the curses were always in touch and the curses were always in touch. Some of you can't bear being out of touch so you're 
obsessed and you're, we've said, live life to the max. That's a bad thing to tell people. Because that narrows the narrows the gap, and you see it gets so small does your margin that now you have no financial margin because you're living in debt, spending what you don't have, and you've moved away from your sweet spot financially, and now you have no financial margin. You're always behind the curve, worried about certain colored envelopes coming through the door, always behind. And now you've no creative margin, haven't had a new idea for a long time. I've not had a creative conversation for a long time. You have no relational margin. Can't fit people into your life. Can't see anybody. Can't hang out. You're always behind the curve and always maxed out. It's like driving your car down the road with all the warning lights on. You keep going anyway. Put some margin into your life. That's why Jesus did often get away, often withdrew to solitary places. What's he doing? He's creating margin in his life. Isn't it amazing that Jesus came to reach the world, he had three years to do it. And despite having a short time to fulfill his mission, he still stepped away from people. Because he came to heal the sick, he didn't want to become sick. And you become sick when you give too much of yourself to people and don't keep enough of yourself back that's between you and God. So you have to put some margin into your life. The band are back up here to give you hope that we finish soon. <laughs> Every service needs that hope. I've been in a lot of services where I wish the band had got up a lot sooner. I'd abandoned all hope that it would ever finish. But not in Hillsong. Margin in your life. Number six, you all okay? Learn to play. Play. Learn to play. Some of you need no encouragement about that. Learn to play. Because sociologists, psychologists tell us, this is fascinating to me, and I think so true, that the older we get, the less we play, especially men. We get so busy doing stuff, get so important, we're in touch, we're needed, building our career, our life, we just stop playing. You know why? Because play has no intrinsic value at all. It is, it is not in our DNA to play because our ancestors, if they had played, would have been killed by a saber-toothed tiger. They're busy just hunting and gathering and providing. Something of that is certainly ingrained in our Western existence. You have to commit to learn to play because we don't stop playing. Here's the thing. We don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. Did you get that? We don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stopped playing, because we stopped having fun, because we stopped being stupid. When I say play, I don't mean the competitive goal some of you play. When you have a bad day, if you don't win, it's like, Arr! I don't mean that. That's not play. I mean the kind of play that only grandkids can get you to do. My grandkids would come and get me rolling on the floor. And the gift of grandchildren, amongst other things, is grandkids teach you to play again in midlife. If I could do this with my kids, but now I'm in my midlife. And now again, I'm rolling around on the floor and I'm doing Lego and I'm doing dollies and girl play. I know. But we have six granddaughters and two grandsons and we have four daughters ourselves. I got the girl play down. When the boys came, I'm like, yes, now I can buy guns and knives and stuff and we can, we can kill stuff and we can watch stuff on the TV that the girls are squeamish about. When I got son-in-laws in my house, I'm like, thank God, I've got, I lived my life with five women. I'm in Hormone Central for years. My son-in-laws are like, yes, I've got, I've got watch a movie in silence, friends. You girls don't know how to watch a movie and be quiet. What? Let's watch a movie. Come on, fellas. Let's watch a movie. Lights out, screen set. I invest in a nice big surround sound, nice big TV. Good. Son-in-laws, you're yeah, a bit quiet. Don't talk. Yeah, come on, guys. TV on, movie. Oh, I'm like 50 minutes in. This is awesome. Not a sound. Not, not, not a conversation. Just nothing. I'm like, this is awesome. Yes, thank you, Lord, for these, these brothers, these band of brothers. <laughs> Hang on. 15 minutes in. I feel a leg come across my lap. 
a bad leg. Then I'm like, ooh, now in my hand appears some massage cream from my wife that says, well, you're doing nothing else. You might as well rub my leg. I'm like, get lost. I'm not doing that. That's banned. You can't do that. And then it's like, ooh, somebody's opened some nail varnish across the lounge. See? Now it's turned into a spa, a girlified atmosphere. And we're just trying to watch the freaking movie. You've got to learn to play. You've got to learn to play. Add play into your life. Researchers said, neural researchers, brain researchers said this already interestingly. They said, research shows that many people are suffering from PDD. Play deficit disorder. Commit to being playful. You can't, you can't, you can't look at creation, can you? And not conclude that God isn't playful. I mean, who came up with a giraffe? What happened that day? What? I mean, how? How unnecessary is that neck? It's ridiculous. Who needs that? You can't look at creation. You can't see dolphins and animals playing and, and doing crazy things on these Instagrams that you follow. I'm, I'm, you know, animal videos, Instagram. Oh, there you are, give them a big plug. Always animals doing crazy stuff. You think God is so playful and yet we become so serious. And you can put Jesus down now. He can walk all by himself. He doesn't need you to run the world and stay up at night and help him to change. The, you're not carrying it all. God is. He's given you room to be playful because he is playful. It is in your spiritual DNA to be playful. I've got to stop because the band are getting louder and louder. Like, get off. <laughs> Hello, get off. Seven and finally, manage expectations. And I'm done. You've got to manage your expectations. Oh, gosh. Listen to me. You cannot stop people promising you the earth and delivering nothing. You can't stop people promising you the world, over-promising and always under-delivering. Some people do that in your life all the time and it's killing you because they're close to you. You have to manage your expectations because if you don't, you will manage your disappointments and your suffering and your discouragement and your confusion and your anger. You're going to manage that anyway because you set yourself up to manage that. But if you will be proactive and say, you know what, as they're promising you the world, you know what, you can count on me. I love you. No one, you know, I'll never, I'll never let you. As they're saying it to you, be saying to you, liar. I don't believe that. I don't buy into that. Great. Yeah, fantastic. And inside yourself, dial it down. Put it somewhere else it realistically can be. You hand yourself a massive gift if you will manage your expectations. Expectations are a huge gift from God, but they do not come with instructions. So you have to figure out. When Peter said, Jesus, you can rely on me. I will not deny you. Jesus said, Peter, before it gets dark, you'll deny me three times. You know what Jesus did? He managed not to believe him. Knowing he would go to the cross alone knowing he would die alone and so when he's on the cross alone he wasn't in resentment he knew he'd be alone why because he managed his expectations to a place that he wasn't battling that on the cross he knew that they wouldn't be there where this year can you take charge of your expectations and not set yourself up again for someone to take you for a ride because they over promised yet again and under delivered there i'm done Wow. Let's stand together, come on.